Good morning. Welcome back. We are now into a new book, the book of Romans. Over the last uh, year or two, we have covered the Gospels, the Gospel, the four books of the Gospel. And then, from the beginning of this year, we started on the book of Acts, which is a book of history by the great historian Luke, Dr. Luke. And so now we move on to another section of the New Testament. And these are the epistles by the Apostle Paul to the churches and also to a couple of individuals that he ministered to. So, here we are, a long journey ahead of us, and we ask God to help us. So, Father, we thank you once again for this privilege of coming before you week after week, sitting at, your, at the foot of your throne, and just to wait upon you, just to to just soak in everything that you will downpour upon us, even from this book of Romans. Lord, it is indeed a very demanding book, um, theological in every sense, and with application. And we, your disciples, would want to learn every truth that you have for us, and teach us, reveal to us over the months that We'll be looking at this and also to help us to apply, to be better disciples for you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, the book of Romans. So, before I get into the introduction to the book of Romans, perhaps I should uh, just give you a brief outline, a brief history of the epistles that Paul wrote even during his years of ministry. So if you look at the screen, uh, Paul's epistles to the churches. These were written to encourage, to warn, and to instruct, uh, in particular, three groups. First, uh, the churches that he had founded in his three mission trips the churches he had not visited even during his years of ministry and to a couple of individuals so looking at the first one the churches that he had founded you will find that he wrote to this uh, people in Corinth the church in Corinth first and second Corinthians he also wrote to the church in Galatia the Galatians and you also have the Ephesians and the Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Then we have uh, the churches he had not visited. And this are uh, in Rome, the, Ro the, the Roman church he had not visited. He was just writing. And this book that we are going to embark on is actually a letter of introduction before Paul went to Rome. And also to the Colossians, a church started, but he had never visited that church. And to individuals, so you have uh, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. First and second Timothy, and Titus, and then Philemon. And if you had noticed, I put an asterisk uh, uh, at the top of some books, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Why? Because these were prison epistles. These were epistles or letters. Epistles, epistle means a letter. Why letter? Because a letter is personal. Written to an individual or written to people, it is personal. And while many are in prison waiting to get out so that they can do more, but not Paul. Paul, in fact, he did so much while he was in prison his heart was still for the lost souls. His heart was still for the churches, for the uh, believers that he has uh, won to Christ. And he wanted to disciple them. And he wrote, he wrote these prison epistles. And then we look at Paul's style. As you read the epistles, you'll find a very common pattern, a very common style. 
And first of all, in each of his letter or epistle, he would identify himself and his addresses. And he starts right at the beginning. But contemporary writing today, when we write to others, we always sign off at the bottom. That we look to the bottom of the letter, we know who sent it and what is his capacity, what is his title, what is his office. But in the days of old, when Paul was writing, they, they normally uh, write and identify themselves right at the top. Why? Because those days is unlike today, where they are all printed paper or email. Those days, the correspondents were in scrolls, so they roll them up. So if your name is at the bottom, the recipient would have to ro unroll the whole scroll until the end. And if it's a long scroll, it's going to take a bit of time. So they unroll the thing all the way to the end. Then they can see who was the sender. So it wasn't practical. So what they did in those days is right at the top, when they just unroll a bit, the name of the sender is there. So Paul identifies himself and his addresses, and we shall see even as we start the book of Romans in, in, in chapter 1. In the first few verses, I think first seven verses, he presented his credentials. And then he sends them greetings. He sends them greetings. Now, greetings, uh, they are very common. They are laced with grace uh, and blessings upon this people upon the recipients, upon the church that he's addressing. He sends them greetings. And he would also give thanks for them. And he would intercede for them. Pre Paul was a prayerful person and he's always interceding. He's always praying for his sheep, for his flock. And then when we get to the meat of the letter, you will find doctrine. In fact, if you study his epistles, they are very, uh, 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 I mean, very uh, clear that there is the first part, which is doctrine, and then the second part, it's application. So, first part, it is the word, and the second part, it is the works. And if doctrine is not translated into duty, or the word is not translated to works, then the gospel is not effective. I mean, then people are just filling their, their, their head with knowledge, but they are not manifesting in works. So you look at D deals with doctrinal questions, and then E is dealing with the application to life. And as he concludes, as he brings the letter to a conclusion, there will be greetings from his companions. So to let the people know that he wasn't alone, he was working with a team. So from his companions, his travel companions, and to various people, the people that he knew. He may not have been to Rome, but he knew some people in Rome. And he wanted to be personal. He wanted to reach out to them, to connect with them. So to to greet them even in the conclusion of his epistle. And then he ends the letter with a benediction. Benediction is to, to bestow a blessing upon the congregants or even the readers of the letter, uh, even as he brings this epistle to a close. So he begins and ends with the unspeakable gift of God's grace in Christ. So everything is centered on Jesus Christ and it's not about him, it is about Jesus. It is not by his own effort, it's all by the grace of God. And that's how he wrote the letters. On this diagram, you will see uh, Paul's letters. Now I wish, let me see if I can bring this, yeah, so you can see, right? Earlier on, if I can bring it down, yeah, okay, so you get it. Yeah, the screen is just a bit too big. So, Paul's epistles to the churches, we have done that. So, now we look at this. Paul's letters. 
And um, just to give you a chronological order of uh, Paul's letters, um, now this this dates. If you look at different uh, commentators, uh, some have got different order because no one can be really certain of the exact dates or when the letters were written. But to the best of their knowledge, some have uh, concluded this is the order. And here we see um, Galatians being the first book to be written, first letter to be written. But in some scholars' uh, uh, commentary, uh, they put Thessalonians to be first. Doesn't matter. So in 35 AD, Paul was converted. And then about 46, about 10 years later or more, he went on his first missionary journey. He did not start off day two after he was converted. He had 10 years of personal tutoring by Jesus and then he went to do some work in Antioch before he set, for, set forth on his first mission trip. Then Paul attended the Council of Jerusalem in 49, 50 AD and in 50 AD he wrote to the church in Galatia. And on his second missionary journey, 50 to 52 AD, he wrote the first letter to the Thessalonians and then he wrote the second letter to the Thessalonians. And in his third mission trip, 53 to 57 AD, he wrote first to the Corinthians and then again he wrote the second letter to the Corinthians. I covered this uh, last Sunday during the commissioning service about Paul uh, being in uh, Ephesus but he wrote to the church in Corinth telling them of his plans to visit the Corinthians. Then in 57 AD he wrote to the Romans. He stayed, he stayed in, 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 uh, in uh, Ephesus for three years and during these three years he wrote and he wrote to the, the Romans as a form of introduction that I am coming. Pray, pray, pray for me. I'm praying for you. Pray for me that I can be free from all this and I can come to you in Rome. Then in 57 to 60 AD, Paul's arrest, imprisonment and journey to Rome. The sea journey which I covered at uh, sometime, I think it was in April, right? Anchors for the storm. Then 60 to 62 AD, Paul in Rome awaiting trial before the Roman Emperor Nero and it was here as I mentioned while he was in prison he wrote epistles to the Ephesians, the Colossians, the Philo Phil uh, to, to Philemon and also to the Philippians right so, so they are called uh, prison epistles. Now there is one letter here the Laodiceans which scholars and historians said he wrote but it was never found it was lost anyway that's for your knowledge and then in 62 to 67 AD there was it is indicated here as Paul's fourth journey for Paul's fourth missionary journey um, well we all know him I mean to the best of our knowledge we we always thought of his three missionary journeys then his fourth journey was his sea trip to Rome. But here, uh, in this diagram, this fourth missionary journey refers to the time when Paul was set free. So after he was uh, in house arrest for, I think, about two years, he was released. We studied this last week. He was released for a short while. And some scholars believe that he went to Rome. He, you know, he went to Spain. He may have gone, he may not have gone, we don't know. But during his release, he wrote the first letter to Timothy, his beloved disciple Timothy. He also wrote to the other beloved disciple of his, Titus. And then he was re-arrested the second time. And this time he wasn't under house arrest. This time he was in prison. He was treated like a prisoner, a real prisoner. I think he did not have the same visitor privileges as he did the first time. And he was awaiting execution. 
and while awaiting execution, he wrote his last epistle to his disciple Timothy, and that is the second letter to Timothy. And you find in this letter uh, emotions pouring out, clearly indicated in the epistle. We will come to that in the months ahead. Finally, in AD 70, 67, sorry, AD 67, Paul was executed in Rome. So that this these are the letters of Paul. And today we are going to start on uh, oh before that let me let me talk a bit about Paul's background. Paul's background. So let me bring ah uh, so you can see. Okay. So let's have a bit of understanding of Paul before we proceed to the book of Romans. Paul was a Jew uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, and who was the first king of I mean of Israel? Saul, right? King Saul. Uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. And so scholars believe, you know, the name of Saul, King Saul, Saul men means uh, us of God, us of God. And so Paul was named in honor of the first king of Israel. He was named Saul. But later, as we studied in the book of Acts, his name was changed to Paul. But he was named Saul at birth. He grew up in a religious family, that is Judaism. He was named after the first king of Israel, Saul, and he studied at this renowned university of that time, Tarsus University, and it was ranked number three then. I don't know how the ranking was done based on uh, the, the intelligence of the students or the attainment of whatever grades and achievement. I, I don't know, but it was supposed to be a top university, and he studied there. He spoke Greek. Greek was the lingua franca. Lingua franca means the common language. Like today, in the global environment, the lingua franca is English. You can get by with English wherever you go. Yeah, who knows if China becomes a superpower of the world, then we will all be speaking Zhongguohua, Putonghua. Okay, so uh, the lingua franca then was Greek and Paul was very fluent in that. He was a Roman citizen. Somehow his father uh, must have done something for the Roman ruler and uh, they, 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 they had their citizenship and Paul was born a Roman citizen and he knew the Roman law. He was really uh, someone who was educated, someone who is learned and he knew the Roman law. And he used that to his benefit in the year in his years of ministry. Um, so, because of all this, he was most suited to be a missionary of for God, and God used him, and God will use us as He has designed us to be, and on the gifts and and based on the gifts that He has given to us, where He has placed us, He will use us to the fullest potential, and for all that Paul had been given and blessed with and, and grew up with and had studied and learned, God used him to be the missionary to the Gentiles. And after his encounter with Christ, he spent three years in the Arabian suburbs. We studied that in the book of Acts. He had his private tuition up there in Damascus, in the suburbs. And then 10 years in Tarsus before commencing his ministry. So that's just a simple background of the Apostle Paul. Now his strategy, how he went about in his ministry. Wherever he went, he planted churches in the cities. Because it would be, I mean, those days the mode of transport was, was basically your feet and perhaps another four more feet or legs, donkey, right? Uh, so, uh, no, 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 no automobile, no air transport, no nothing except ship by sea. So it would be really cumbersome and laborious and difficult for them 
to, to really get into the inner parts, the rural areas. So his, but that wasn't the reason. His strategy was he should plant churches even in the cities and from the cities where he had taught these disciples would then go because they are indigenous people they are local people they would then go into the they would then go into the villages go into the rural areas to reach out to the local people and that was the strategy and that it was effective even for Paul's ministry yeah, I'm trying to sh get you the full so you can see okay sorry for the distraction but uh, doing this and teaching they are actually two different tasks meant for two different people but I'm here doing it by myself so uh, so he visited churches, no, he planted churches uh, in the cities and he revisited the churches wherever he went because you can't start something and leave them to grow on their own. They may not make it. They may not grow. They may be excited for a while, then they fizzle out. So they need to be established in the word of God and they need to be tutored. And so Paul made it a point to revisit the churches that he has started. That's the second mission journey and the third mission journey. And wherever he went, he appointed local leaders. So he did not send leaders from Antioch. He did not send leaders from Jerusalem. But he appointed the local ones. Because these are indigenous people. These are the people who know their people better. And they would make better leaders, being able to relate to this uh, local congregation. So these local leaders and many, many pl every place that he went, he appointed elders. So not elder, elders. So it's plurality of leadership. And that's what he did. And he also wrote because he could not be at every place at any time. Sometimes due to weather, due to other uh, priorities and, 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 and opposition uh, he could not go to certain places or maybe he was in prison as in Rome and so the next best thing was to write and he did and I put that in parenthesis dictated because uh, his eyesight wasn't the best he was suffering from an eye disease uh, as what scholars said and so he dictated so there was a scribe a secretary if you may uh, who would pen down and record whatever Paul said. And so these letters were dictated by Paul to the scribe and they were recorded and preserved for us. So for those places he could not visit or he could not visit them again, he wrote. And also we thank God he did that because uh, uh, today we are holding this and, and studying this that we be established that we be edified if not for these letters we would have missed out a lot a lot of what god had intended for the church so thank god that the some comments right so thank god that the new testament churches were not perfect so all the churches he he, he attended to he went he started in, in asia in europe yeah in ephesus in Corinth, in thessalonica and elsewhere they were not perfect that's why he had to write to them to, to correct them and to teach them in the way that they should go if they were perfect there'll be no episode there'll be no letters today this morning Saturday morning is a free Saturday morning you can go and do your shopping thank God that he used letters for divine revelation because they are personal they are personal it's, it's not some holy document only holy people with halos can can have access to it but no th these are letters for divine revelation means from god to man and they are good because they are personal written to individuals or written to people people ordinary people like you and i intended for you and i so they are personal and they are practical related to life so that we can apply it 
in our daily walk. And Paul's letters, Paul's letters average about 1,300 words. Now, let me tell you, scrolls of those days were not cheap. Not cheap. The poor, the ordinary people cannot afford. So they are limited. But it had to be preserved. It has, it, they, it, I mean, the, the letters had to be recorded and preserved. So they are on scrolls. And Paul has so much, or rather God has so much for his church through Paul. And so he had all this written down, dictated and written down. And so on the average, his epistles were like 1,300 words. Of course, the longest is this one that we are studying now, soon. Uh, this book of Romans has 7,000 words. So we're going to take some time on this. 7,000 words. Now, letters of those days average 18 to 209. 209 words. As I mentioned, they are not cheap. The longer the scroll, the more expensive expensive because it is not like there's a factory churning out all this they, they really have to manually go and get all the pepperers and dry them and roll them sun them whatever and then they write it is not cheap so the shorter the better but not paul he had word from god and that's why the length so now we come to the next one okay so this epistle to the romans we are still in the introduction to the book of romans uh, so let me try and bring this down so that you can see yep epistle to the romans yes so the theme the theme here is God's plan of salvation explained and applied. Okay, hopefully you can see now, yes. So this epistle is about God's plan of salvation explained and applied. Now, according to Martin Luther, this is the most comprehensive and logical uh, exposition of the gospel. It is the purest gospel, even as expounded by Paul in this letter to the Romans. And in this, in this letter, it will reveal to us the righteousness of God, uh, to, in the, even as found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we studied Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and we, see, we, 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 we see that man, man throughout history has been trying to attain righteousness, to be perfect, but they failed in every count. But now, standing before them is Jesus. Jesus, the perfect one. Jesus, the sinless one. And no one can come to the Father except through Him. And it is not by works, it is purely by His grace. Just by placing your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you, you shall be forgiven. And you shall be adopted into God's family. And in so doing, the righteousness of God is imputed upon you. You put on that robe of righteousness. Jesus put it on you. So now in the book of Romans, we, we have exposition. And it is explained and ex applied even in these writings. So it is a very, very, it, it is probably the most theological book in the New Testament. So it demands our fullest attention as we study verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Secondly, an exposition by Paul on the doctrine of justification by Christ. And by now, by now, Paul wasn't a rookie believer. He was already a believer for about 20 years or more. And now, he explains, 
the doctrine of justification because the just shall live by faith. It was first mentioned and recorded even in the Old Testament by the prophet, I think it's Jeremiah. But people could not comprehend the thing. And now Paul explains it. And because of this, the just shall live by faith. That changed the life of Martin Luther. And with that, he found the truth. And with that, he started the Protestant movement, or rather the Reformation. They brought about the change that it is not by works. The just shall live by faith. Faith in Christ through... No. Faith in Christ through the grace offered by our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the doctrine of justification that by grace you have been saved, not of your works that you cannot boast, yeah, and is purely by grace. So theologically, it is the most important, it is the most important uh, of all Paul's epistles. Most comprehensive and logical presentation of the gospel. We, we know by now that Paul was a great communicator, even as he he preached in Greece and, and, and all the sermons recorded for us in the book of Acts. He was very systematic and he knew how to approach the subject. And it also depended a lot on whether his audience were Jews or whether his audience were Gentiles. The Jews knew about God. His approach is different from the Gentiles who knew nothing about God. And he had no idea of the law. And he was able to do so effectively. And here, here in the Rome, in, in the letter to Epis to the Romans, it was a very, very comprehensive and logical presentation. I will show you the outline later uh, that you can fully understand the mind of uh, Paul. Next, Romans is uh, is Paul's most elaborate definition of the gospel you know the gospel the gospel is the good news it is not good views it is not my view i think you think my opinion your opinion no it's not about good views it's about good news and it's not about new news it's nothing new it is the same news as it has been all the centuries past it is two thousand years plus it is still the good news and he was elaborating this the gospel and he wrote all this in anticipation of his visit to the roman church on his way to spain you know he, his desire had always to go to spain beyond rome after rome he wanted to go further he wanted to go to spain and here was a letter of introduction he has not visited rome but there had been some believers in Rome and these believers in Rome started the church in Rome not not started by Peter not started by Paul and scholars believe these people who started the church in Rome were probably the Jews or the people who were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came and visited the 120 uh, prayer warriors in the upper room and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit and they all burst forth in tongues. And everyone else in Jerusalem who were there, they heard, they heard this proclamation. They heard all these prayers in their own language. And then Paul and then Peter stood up and preached the first sermon. And on that day, 5,000 were saved. And amongst them, people from different nations. Some of them were from Rome. And they must have gone back to Rome, saved and excited. And they started the church in Rome. And though Paul had not been to Rome, but he knew of these believers in Rome. And so he wrote this epistle to them. It's a letter of introduction to tell them that I'm praying for you. I plan to come. I'm coming, God willing. Yeah, pray for me so that I can also come to see you in Rome. 
So this was his uh, letter in anticipation of his visit to the Roman Church on his way to Spain. Now I wrote this as well. What the gospel is, you know. So far, you you know right the emphasis. This is letter to to the Romans. It is about the gospel. It is elaborated, well elaborated. The definition, the exposition of the gospel. So, simply put, as I I, I indicated in the title, yeah, um, Romans. A simple description of this is what the gospel is. This letter, what the gospel is. Now, if you study, when you study Galatians, then the title is "What the Gospel Is Not." What the gospel is not. So here is what the gospel is, and there Paul presented the argument: what the gospel is not. We will come to that in due course. So back to here. Um, so the purpose of this episode is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. Now, as I mentioned, that uh, the church in Rome was started, likely, probably, started by the Ro- by by Roman citizens or Jewish people uh, who stayed in Rome, and, and they were in Jerusalem. They were saved. In Acts chapter two, and they went back to Rome, and they started the church there. So it wasn't started by Peter, definitely not. And Paul had this uh, 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 principle: uh, he will not start something and build upon another person's ministry. He wanted to start afresh wherever he went. Uh, if if you let me see if I can remember, I think it's Romans fifteen verse twenty. Yes, so Romans 15 verse 20, uh, Paul said, or Paul wrote, And so I made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, you know, and so on. So Paul would not go to a place where someone had already started the ministry. He, his personal aim was to preach where no one has preach Christ before and so it definitely wasn't Peter otherwise if Peter had started the church there Paul would not go there he did not want to build on another man's foundation not that Paul was proud but I believe uh, the, the the harvest field is so wide we don't need to cover the same ground let's do let's attend to different uh, uh, areas so we can be more uh, extensive expensive so Let's go back to Romans chapter. Okay, no, let's go back to the slide. Yeah, here. So, to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named, so he went, and that's why he went to Rome. Next, Paul summarizes that both Gentiles and Jews cannot escape the judgment of sin, but that through Jesus Christ and his death, both are now justified by faith. So we are all sinners. Romans 3 to 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, whether you are Gentile or Jew, and you cannot escape the judgment or sin because you are a sinner. But but there is hope through Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection. Both, both, both Gentiles and, and Jews, they have that opportunity to be saved and if you place your trust in Christ you shall be justified by faith not by works by faith next Paul also provides a long response to why Israelites did not embrace their Jewish Messiah and you know the toughest bunch were the Israelites because they are so steep and so anchored and they endeared so much to the uh, law of Moses it, it's not that they were pious but it's just that something that by tradition by tradition they have been taught it's been passed down so uh, they, they don't want to do anything different they, they just want to hold on to their tradition so Paul took a bit of effort took a bit of time to, to really uh, enlighten them 
Israel in the past under the law Israel present yeah what is offered to them what is before them and Israel in the future into the future what God has in mind for them and if you read all the way if you read uh, Romans uh, 11 26 If you read Romans 11, 26, this is 11, right? Romans 11. So this is about the future. Chapter 9 is about the past. Chapter 10 is present. Chapter 11 is future. And I like this. And, I'm, and I, I, I hope and I pray that the Israelites, the, the Jews in Israel, yeah, those who are not enlightened yet, they shall see this. And so all Israel shall be, will be saved. All Israel, one day in future, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the deliverer is the Savior, the Messiah, will come out of Zion, Jerusalem, Zion. And he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, from Israel. For this is my covenant and God doesn't break covenant. He keeps covenant. When I take away their sins, that day, all Israel will be saved. Now, does it mean a blank check? No. But in the future, when the Israelite shall repent, God in His mercy will forgive them and take away all their sins in the last days, in future. And when they repent and submit themselves to Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. And God will turn away all the enemies. And, and you know, you read all the way to Revelation. Very simple. God wins. Not Satan. God wins. He will turn away all ungodliness from Jacob. And that is God's covenant with Israel. When I take away their sins. So, back to here. So, it's very interesting. We should... When we, when we come to chapters 9, 10, and 11 about Israel. Yeah, and he had to deal with that because there, 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 were, there, there were many Jews even in Rome and he had to deal with that. So, uh, again, a bit of repetition. Two major parts in, his, in this epistle and for the matter for the other epistles as well. Two major parts in his epistles. Number one, first part is uh, doctrinal, theological. So you will find is uh, even in, in the first 11 chapters of this book of Romans, it is theological, it is doctrinal. It is what we believe. It is what we believe. It is the relationship between man and God. This is doctrine. What we believe. The second part, as in this book, then it will be from chapters 12 to 15. Yeah, so first 11 is doctrine and then 12 to 15 is application practical and is how we should live the first part is what we believe the second part is how we should live how we should apply this doctrine that we have learned so this is relationship living with or living with fellow men so it is relationship between man with man man to man and that is duty means applying what you have learned applying the doctrine that you have learned so to summarize theology some people think theology is a good word but very powerful it's too difficult too deep for us no it, it, it's once you apply it you know it is easy and doctrine ought to result in practical life right we have said this quite a few times and the practical life must be grounded in theology if you can see the screen and practical life must be grounded in theology if your practical life is not according to the word of god then you are a sinner still you are not walking in the ways of god so it has to be grounded in theology or else or else it is not a complete gospel some people only have the hate knowledge but they don't have application some people just want to do good but they don't have the doctrine they don't have the word of God and the word of God is not alive in them so there must be both 
theology and practice and then it will be a complete gospel so the last slide even for this uh, uh, part on uh, introduction there are a couple of key verses here and of course there are a couple more but I just want to highlight this too so the first key verse is Romans chapter 1 verse 16 I'll expand on this when we come to chapter 1 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes first for the Jew for the Jew first and also for the Greek I'm sure you are familiar with this I'm sure you have heard this before Paul is saying I am not ashamed and there is a reason why he used the word ashamed because there were people in Rome who were ashamed of the gospel and there are people today who are also ashamed of the gospel be ashamed no more because it is the power of God it's not your power it's the power of God to salvation you can't save anyone it is the Holy Spirit to salvation for everyone is inclusive everyone but to everyone who believes you don't believe sorry if you believe in Jesus Christ that he is the son of God and God raised him up on the third day after he died and was buried and in the order first to the Jews and then to the Greeks to the Gentiles the other verse the other verse which is uh, uh, considered a key verse is Romans eleven thirty six. for of him through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever amen so everything is centered on Jesus Christ you know everything is centered on Jesus Christ it's all about him for of him of Jesus right yeah that means like from him and through him means through him we can't do anything on our own in the name of Jesus Christ through him we go in his name through him and to him all we have done all we are doing and all we shall do are to him for him are all things to whom be glory forever amen so the outline as I mentioned Paul was very systematic yeah and you will find in the first eight chapters the exposition of the gospel and in a very detailed elaborate uh, exposition of the gospel of the good news then chapters 9 to 11 the explanation of Israel's transformation the explanation of Israel's transformation that means from the past to present and into the future they, they cannot hold on to the past and still desire the fruits of the future there must be transformation right so that's chapter 9 to 11 and then finally the exhortation the application the duty part the exhortation to holy living chapters 12 to 16 so did I, did I say earlier it was 15 um, no it should be 16 right earlier yeah okay so that is simply the introduction to the book of Romans and I hope you are excited to get on this journey with me so until then let's have a break